Okay, guys, I think I will start so people who are coming late, they can join us, so we can get to the lunch as soon as possible. Can you hear me through the microphone? Is this working okay? Okay, great. So it's my honor to be here with you today. This is my second data science conference, actually, that I'm a speaker of. I was here last year. I had amazing time, and I'm having amazing time this year also. And I hope, hope that also works for you as well, that you're also having amazing times and that you're getting a lot of useful values that you're getting a lot of useful ideas that you can test at your organizations and that you will learn something new. My name is Miloš Milovanovic and I come from a company called Things Solver. We are actually a sponsor of this conference and we are a small company that was founded two years ago by Darko Marjanovic and me. We had a chance to hear from him yesterday. And the main focus of our job is dealing with large data, data sets, actually data sets at scale. So we're doing big data analytics, machine learning, a bunch of different stuff actually that we think of when we say data science. We were trying to cover as much things as possible. And besides that, I'm a co-organizer of the local Data Science Serbia community. We're organizing monthly meetups. You heard some parts of it yesterday from Darko, and also I will use a few minutes by the end of this presentation just to say something about the new project that we are trying to uh, work on for, as Data Science Serbia. And I'm really glad that we are making data science in Serbia happen and we are succeeding with building the community. Uh, the main focus of my talk for today will be planning and optimizing a data lake architecture within organization. Uh, you had a chance to hear the first part as we uh, planned to, to talk. You had a chance to hear yesterday from Darko and I will cover just a few slides from him, uh, slides he covered yesterday just to make sure that everybody here uh, knows what I'm talking about, we are on the same page. How many of you actually attended yesterday Darko's talk? Okay, great. I will just cover the most important slides so we are on the same page. So, uh, here is my agenda for today. First, I will talk just a little bit about the business requirements. Why do we need a data lake? Why are we building data lake within an organization? How can we benefit from it? Then I will try to give you a definition. What is a data lake? Uh, what are the main benefits? After that, how, what, how does the common data lake architecture look like within an organization? How do we organize uh, such a solution? Then what are some problems? Of course, there are always problems. What are some of the most important and crucial problems that we faced while deploying data lakes? And how did we manage to deal with these problems and to solve them? Uh, how do we expand the data lake? What is like the final goal how our data lakes should look like? And at the end, how actually we start? But, working with data lakes, how do we plan it, and what are some of the success factors that determine whether we'll make it with, with the data lake. Uh, so first of all, if uh, the main purpose of the data science, of every data project within any organization, is to help the business, to deliver some value. And some of the challenges that basically all of the organizations today have is to modernize their data, data infrastructure within company. So organizations are trying to adapt and put all their data into use. So basically, most organizations today are collecting as much data as we can. All of our organizations. We're trying to keep the track of every transaction we had, of every event that happened with I know, any communication of some person or some other system in a, with our company. But at some point of time, we really need to start processing all of this data, otherwise the whole this thing we are doing doesn't make any sense because the, of course the project of any the purpose of any data collection process is to actually have some analytics on top of that and to generate some insights because otherwise it doesn't make any sense uh, and why is this not an easy task because well uh, we need to be as much flexible as we can uh, and it, sometimes it really might require, require some structural mindset changes within our organizations we really sometimes need to forget about all of the I know, policies and some processes and procedures we keep in order to move fast, to be flexible and agile, in order to succeed and get the most insights out of this data. And also there is one another issue that, that, is, that they're causing us trouble, is that we have all various trends and buzzwords, like every day we hear basically about some new buzzword. And it's something that was kind of a characteristic of the data industry. Data industry during last, I know, 50 years probably, uh, kind of liked and needed all of these buzzwords. I read on the internet while I was preparing for this presentation that uh, once uh, enterprise data warehouse were just a buzzword, and there were people from like really serious organizations that they didn't believe that 
enterprise data warehouse will succeed in delivering any value to organizations. And it really needed to go through some time so we can really benefit from, from data warehouses. Also today we have, like in last, just last few years we have, we had a situation where big data was, was just a buzzword. Then we heard about data fonts, data swamps, data lake also. And I'm here today to try to explain you why I think that data lake it's, is not just a buzzword anymore and why we need to think more about the data lakes and benefit from them. So basically what is the main goal of our organizations today? It is to transform the enterprise data management. As John O'Brien, who is the CEO of Radiant Advisors, it's an American advisory and research company, he explained this very well, like uh, as the data lake is a foundational component and common denominator of the modern lake, data lake uh, data architectures, which is enabling complementing specialized components such as uh, enterprise data warehouses, discovery-oriented environments, and highly specialized analytic or operational data technologies. What does this actually mean? What did he try to say here with this sentence? Is that the main purpose of data lakes is to coexist with other data parts within our organizations and to be just one of the, the to be a central repository which will feed all of these other uh, sources within our organizations, all of the, these other components and all of these components actually need to communicate together and work as one uh, in order to make any sense of this. So this is the very first definition of a data lake. Data lake was, uh, it is a term that is, was coined by uh, James Dixon, who is a CTO and founder of Pentaho. And he actually described data lake like this. So basically we think of a data mart we have within our data warehouse solution as a single bottle single bottle of water, which is cleansed, packaged, structured, it is ready for consumption. Well, then Data Lake is a large body of water in more natural state. So basically we have a bunch of different sources, a bunch of different lake streams that are delivering some data into our Data Lake, and we're trying to dig or actually take a uh, dive into this Data Lake to get what we need out of it and then deliver some value to our businesses. A bit more formal definition uh, says that the Data Lake is a storage repository uh, that holds a vast amount of raw data in its nat native format, both structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. The data structure and requirements are not defined until the, the, day, the data is needed. And here we can see the first di distinction between the data lake and data warehouse within our organization, because with uh, data warehouses we have structured data. We have data that we know structure of, that, is, that has scheme on top of it. And the main idea with the data lake is to keep everything as raw as possible. Basically, we collect, just extract some data from our data source, whatever that source might be, and then we persist it in our data lake. And then when we try to use that data to get some insights from that, then we are giving it structure on top, and then we try to actually crack what does that data contain. Uh, we need to make a distinction, actually, uh, what are the main purposes of data warehouse and data lake. And I will repeat again, the main idea of the data lake is to coexist with data warehouse. These this, this actually approaches, concepts, are really, really should communicate and work well together. That is the main idea. So first of all, in terms of data that we are persisting in both of these systems, in data warehouse we have structured and processed data. Uh, so basically when we are building actually data warehouse, we kind of know how we will use some, some data. And we're, uh, when we extract data from data source, we are giving it structure on top and write it as processed record within our data warehouse. In data lake, we are trying to write everything as we got it and then deal with this later. And in terms of processing, in data warehouse, we have schema on the right. Uh, when we are trying to read something data, to load some data into data warehouse, we need to infer schema on top. In data lake, that's not the case. We don't care about the schema at the beginning when we are loading data into a data warehouse. We just want to deliver all of this data to collect it and deliver it into our data warehouse. And then we can deal with the schema later because we don't, not, we don't want to deal with all of these messy, actually, processes and uh, functions and procedures for defining schema, for example. If we don't need it right now, we might need it, I don't know, in six months or even a year. So we can just easily write it uh, in, in our data lake solution. In terms of storage, data warehouse, in order to store a large volumes of data, we need expensive storage, we need the enterprise storage drives. And that's not the case with the data lake. The main idea of data lake is to have commodity storage. So basically we have some, uh, I don't know, hard drives that are not nothing special, that we already have maybe 
we were using it for, for another project and now we're not using it so we can just attach those, those disks for our data lake solution. And that's the main idea, to have a low cost storage for, for persisting all of these, all of these records. In terms of uh, agility, also actually a way that we are working with, with this data, in the warehouse we are really, really not agile. Because uh, in order to deliver just a new report within data warehouse, for sometimes it can really take even months because the data is really connected to many business processes. It's already a mess out there, so just deploying one new solution on top, one new report can be really, uh, really a challenge. And with Data Lake, we're trying to be agile to configure everything to the purpose that we need, like to be really, really agile with this. In terms of security, uh, security in Data Lake is really mature. Uh, it's really an issue that a lot of people ha have deal with uh, during the past few years. And we're trying to do the same within Data Lakes. So the policies, the basic security within Data Lakes is really maturing. And we have different tools and policies and ideas today how to actually implement security within our, within our Data Lake. So we can really know that this Data Lake is a reliable source for data within our, our organization. In terms of users, data warehouse users are, are business professionals. The main idea of data warehouse is to deliver some reports to the business persons within our organization that can use that information and make some action based on that. And data lake, actually the way most people say it, it's that everybody is user of, uh, of a data lake. And I would like just to disagree a little bit here. I think that, okay, there are some organizations that can have this kind of luxury to give all of their data to basically any person within an organization to use it. But let's be serious, we really cannot do this here, basically in this region within most of our companies. So I think the first users of data lakes should be data scientists that really know how to care, first of all, with, about data quality, uh, data governance, they know how to deal with the data, and they know how to generate reports. So basically data scientists should be early adopters of data lakes so they can ex extract values, some valuable insights from from their data lake and then communicate that information to either, I don't know, data warehouse, actually to the business professionals within organizations so they can actually make informed decisions based on that. And just one thing that I would like to add here, uh, the data lake and data warehouse are different in the way that they are loading data, that we're gathering data into, into the, one of the, both of those systems. So in data warehouse we have ETL process, so basically we extract data from their data source, we trans transform it, so we give it a schema structure, and then we load it into data warehouse. And in data lake we have ELT, actually we extract the data from the data source, load it into our, into our uh, lake, and then transform it when we need it. So just to give you a bit more descriptive application, uh, actually use case for this kind of uh, concepts, Let's imagine that we have some social media streaming applications. So basically we are trying to collect, I don't know, the insights from social networks. We want to know what our customers are saying about our company. And we can really deploy this application using data warehouse as a base and data, data lake as a base. So in the first case, let's say we are having, I don't know, let's say we are just collecting tweets from Twitter. So first, if we had data warehouse as a persistence layer for all these kinds of records, one tweet can contain, I think, for maybe even more than 200 columns, probably, because it's, uh, the number of columns is variable. It, is the, it depends on the tweet, whether you have some attachments, some media, some, I don't know, pictures, links, whatever, hashtags. So if we deploy this kind of solution within Twitter, we would really have, we are, uh, we are data, data warehouse, we would have really complicated schema for 200 columns, and we will probably use, at the beginning, probably not more than 30 columns. So let's say we have collected the data from Twitter for two years, and now we want to add just another use case. For example, we want to know whether uh, male, male users are using different colors than female users on their Twitter accounts. Let's say that this kind of analytics makes some sense to our organization, but we probably wouldn't have this kind of information within our data warehouse, because uh, keeping all of this information that we can retrieve from one tweet in data warehouse would be really expensive, to have enterprise storage persisting some data for two years and probably didn't, we don't know whether we will use it or not. And so we are not really uh, agile, we're not flexible, we can really hard, hardly add new use case for, the, for, for some, some use cases actually. 
And if we, we would use data lake as a persistence layer, we would probably collect all of the, these data to, from the API and persist it in row format. So we would have JSON as the, as the persistence layer on the bottom because it's inexpensive. There is no point to, I don't know, save, save money to cut the costs on storage within data lake because storage is inexpensive. So probably we would keep all of this data in raw format and basically we have all the tweets actually that we collected during the periods from the beginning of, of this use case. You would have everything in raw format so we can basically add any new use case for, for this kind of data. Uh, how does the data, common data lake architecture over you look like? So basically what we're trying to do with the data lake is to support all of these use cases. So we have some uh, real time uh, data that is coming to our organization. Let's say we have, I know, application logs, or we have social media streaming, or whatever that is coming to our organization in real time. Then we have some micro batch and uh, batch jobs that are running frequently uh, each day, each week, each month. And we also need to keep all of these sources into our into our solution, into our data lake. So we have ingestion layer here. We are trying to integrate our solution with all, with all of these sources. And what is good here, for example, we had two sessions about Spark uh, this morning. So we, we can use basically Spark for all, for all of this vert vertical here. Uh, then when we collect all of this data, when we extract it from a data source, we just load it into, let's say, Hadoop. I will explain later why am I saying Hadoop uh, as a common storage for data lake. Then we have some processing tools like multi-parallel processing databases, analytical tools such as Spark or Hive. Uh, we have some workflow managers, uh, system monitoring, everything we need. So we can uh, generate some insights. And then we have insights tire where we are trying to communicate this information to some other process within company. Whether that be, I don't know, data warehouse, uh, some BI reporting tools such as, I don't know, Tableau, Microsoft Power View, uh, Click View, basically everything, every kind of uh, BI tool you're using. And that's the main architecture, arch architectural overview of such a solution. So, why, why did I say that uh, there is HDFS uh, in a data lake? Basically, in general, if we would describe uh, data lake architecture, we can say that data lake is just a bunch of directories and files written in Hadoop. And yeah, if we would talk about this so general, we can say that that's the case, because the main idea of data lake is to persist every, everything cheaply in format that is supported by Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop has a really efficient way to persist everything cheaply on com commodity hardware, so we do really do not have to pay a lot of money for, for the storage here. Uh, Hadoop is uh, usually in the center of data lake architecture, but that's not like, uh, data lake is much broader concept than Hadoop. Hadoop is just a tool, and data lake is a whole new concept, a whole approach to dealing with information. And as I said, Hadoop scalable and low cost persistence layer and its ability to perform big data processing analytics, it is a great tool set to achieve the mastery of dealing with the information to get business values actually from all the data that, that is collected. And if we have data persisted in HDFS, then we can easily add tools such as Apache Hive or Apache Spark and have rich analytics on top, generate insights on top of this data that is written in file system. So this is basically the way that architecture looks like. So we have different data sources that are delivering the data into our, into our data lake. We have Hadoop distributed file system, which is the persistence layer of, of our data lake. And then we have Hive and Spark on top for the analytics for uh, different use cases here. And then we can uh, integrate with Hive and Spark from various tools, other tools within our enterprise data system to communicate this information to business persons. And this architecture, as shown here, acts like SQL. I will tell you later why this is not a SQL and why we shouldn't treat it as a SQL. Uh, but basically, it, it looks like a SQL because we have a SQL as a querying language we have in Spark. It is efficient and scalable, so if we need more resources, we just add more machines. Uh, we can connect to basically anything, any other part, uh, data tool, whatever, within organization, uh, and we can have different processing modes. So we can uh, support all of the use cases like from batch ingestion, real-time streaming, machine learning, ad hoc analysis, uh, basically all, all the uh, 
processing mods are supported with this. And why I said that this, uh, this system only acts like SQL? Because it is not a SQL. Uh, Hadoop in combination with Spark and Hive is much different than a typical database because these two systems are, are tailored for whole different purposes. And if we try to treat the system of Hadoop and Spark and Hive together as a SQL, we'll probably face a lot of problems. Uh, trust me, we faced a lot <laughs> during the years and projects we were working on. And such a problem, for example, this is a query that you should never probably write. And I have to admit that I, I sometimes write a query like this. Why is running a query like this uh, a bad choice? For what are we doing? We are trying to have random access to some record within terabytes of, uh, of files. So we have something that looks like a table in Hive. And we want to search some record. And our table can have terabytes of data persisted. And when we, when we write a query like this, uh, the Hadoop will have to read all of the records, that all the files that are written in HDFS. And for terabytes of data, that's probably a lot of files. So this query might run for hours, even days. So uh, Spark, Hive, and Hadoop are not tailored to answer to questions like this. If you have to write these kind of queries periodically, if you need to run them in production, it is the, the best approach will be to use any other tool that is tailored for this system. Whether that be, I don't know, some NoSQL database, SQL database, but Hive and Spark in combination with Hadoop are really a terrible choice for this. Uh, another problem that we can face here if we are treating the whole system as a database is that there are no updates and deletes. Actually, Hive syntax does support uh, update and delete as a command. There is a way to make Hive work as a transactional database but it's not recommended to use this kind of, to have this kind of use case in production. The system basically causes more troubles than it solves uh, with this approach. So we should probably forget for now using updates and deletes in this kind of production. And in Spark, you cannot write update or delete query if working with SQL. And uh, if we try to, if you have many users that are using, I don't know, power, let's say Tableau to access data to, from Hive and uh, Spark, uh, and if they're all trying to co connect to the Hive table or Spark table uh, concurrently, then uh, probably our cl cluster will fail or it will go into troubles because the system is not made for these kind of purposes. And the best solution here would be to use another database. So basically we can generate reports, get insights, write all of these reports into that another database and then co collect, connect to this another database for, with such a BI tool. And here you can see you will get the links for the presentation, the slides for the presentation. You can see a link here. Actually, this is the webinar made by Databricks by Vida Ha, senior software architect from Databricks. And she really gives here uh, valuable uh, information how to use and how to not use Spark within an organization. What are some of the mo most frequent errors people, people make when using systems like this? So how do we optimize such a solution when we're working with Spark, Hive, Data Lakes? Well, first, the thing that I would like to recommend if you're using Hive, it is to use ORC file format. Uh, Hive, actually, it's not a relational database. It's, it's just a tool that at some point acts like one, but it persists all of its data in files. And if we use ORC file format, ORC is shortened for uh, optimized row column. It is a file format that keeps all the data organized into columns. So basically we have a table with 200 columns and we're trying to access only two of them. ORC knows how to read only those two columns and not whole rows. So basically our queries will run much faster. And also by using ORC file format, uh, we're getting file compression. So basically we are trying to, we have two benefits here with using ORC. We are uh, using less storage and we have faster queries. Uh, also, another problem with Hadoop and Hive it is uh, when we have a lot of small files. So let's say we didn't care that updates and deletes are not supported in uh, Hive, are, are not production ready, and we have this kind of use case. So basically, we're trying to update one record for today, and this record, will, this update command will create a new Delta file that actually keeps the track of the changes. So uh, we won't physically delete this record from our file. We'll just create another Delta file that will say, okay, this record should be deleted. So each of these commands will generate a bunch of small files. 
and we will face a problem that our Hadoop cluster will have too much small files and we might probably kill our cluster with this approach. So a file compaction is a strategy that we, take, that we use to deal with these kind of problems when we have a lot of small files. And what actually file compaction does it, is just that it collects all of the smaller files for some schema and tries to merge them into larger files. So basically we are optimizing the way that our queries are run with this approach. And also for deduplication strategies, of course we need to take care about the duplication within our Hadoop cluster, within our data lake solution. But if we're trying to deal with this as soon as the duplicate records arrive, we will also face problems because we will also generate a bunch of small files. So what is the kind of approach that I would like to suggest? It is to, of course, have some deduplication strategy running in batch, but if you and don't care if you have some duplicates written on daily basis or weekly basis, because writing a query that will select uh, just the records that are variable and remove the duplicates uh, can run really fast on Hadoop, and it is much better strategy than trying to delete and deduplicate the data. Also, if you already have, if you're running a Hadoop cluster. Uh, in my experience, it is the best choice would be to make Spark also run on Yarn because Yarn has amazing way to deal and with the resources, to schedule jobs, to manage resources. So we can really benefit from running Spark on Yarn. Also, try to use Spark data frames as much as possible. Spark data frames, you had a chance to hear that uh, this morning from Peter. Uh, Spark data frames are bringing significant performance uh, improvements for Spark. Uh, it's in the, because of the way they are organized and they actually are. Uh, so running a application with Spark data frames can really uh, bring significant uh, performance improvements. And if we have a query that will, if we have some selects, actually we have some subset of the data uh, from our data lake and we will query it, I know, for, we'll write three queries to select from that, that data. I would suggest to cache your data into memory because with data caching, we're actually uh, getting the whole subset this, that we will query, writing, writing it into memory. And then every query we will run on top of that sub, sub, uh, subset of the data will be uh, delivered into memory. We will execute in memory and the whole system, the whole Spark, the Spark wouldn't need to read the data files. Because unless we, if we do not use caching, uh, each of these queries will be reading from the, from the disks. And this, then there is no purpose for, for using Spark. But uh, uh, just a bit, just a notion here. Uh, if you have 10 gigabytes of large subset that you want to query, you will need much more RAM memory for caching all of this data because Spark uh, uses significant amounts of memory for its prop, uh, processes to keep all of its variables. So if you have 10 gigabytes of uh, data that you will query, you need a bit more data, a bit more memory available for, for, your, for your cluster. And of course, never forget about the traditional databases. Uh, many pro problems can be fixed. Many problems that we face uh, within a data lake uh, architecture can be solved using traditional databases, uh, no matter which one. And they really uh, have amazing performance for the things they are made, for the use cases they are made for. And also extended tool set. So uh, you should always think about the use case, think what you're trying to do with it's your data processing with your data lake, and then use the right tool for the job. For example, let's go back to our Twitter streaming application. If we have used the, I know, if we have analyzed just the number of tweets that are uh, generated on Twitter on daily daily basis for two years, and then we have some new specialist come, that came to our organization and he wants to do full text search on top of these tweets, uh, this kind of scenario can be delivered, deployed through Hive and Spark, but the performance will be terrible because Spark and Hive are not tailored for full-text search use cases. And a better approach here would be to use tools such as Elasticsearch or Solar or basically any other system that supports full-text search. So basically the main idea is to use the right, right tool for the job. And by the end of our project, what probably our data lake uh, architecture should look like is something like this. So we have HDFS here as the persistence layer. It's where all of our data sets are written in raw formats, in, in, in uh, structured or unstructured, whatever. And then we have Spark, we have Hive to do the analytics. 
We have Kafka as a message broker that will read the real-time messages from some other system and deploy them into, into our Hadoop cluster. We, we can implement Elastic for doing a full text search. We can have a SAS or Spark for machine learning algorithms. Uh, PostgreSQL for some re re relational stuff. IBM Watson if we need uh, cognitive insights. Basically, we can connect most of the data tools to this system, and that's the best way to use data lake architecture within organization. Of course, the list of the tools is much, much more bigger, so basically you can connect with anything you can imagine of to, to the system like this. And here we can see a chart that was made by a Radiant Advisors. So I mentioned their CEO at the beginning. And this is a data lake maturity chart where they are trying to they identi identify four stages within every organization in terms of data lake maturity. So as, an, as a first stage, we have evaluate technology stage where we are trying to acquire technology skills. So basically, we have some department within our organization that tries to basically master the technology. So they've probably heard of the data lakes. They, want, they have some use cases uh, in their mind and try to deliver some solution, but basically the main idea here is to master the technology, so basically figure out how the whole this system communicates and how can we benefit the most out, out of it. The second stage is reactionary uh, stage where we have uh, IT efficiency, so basically we know how to use the tools, we know uh, how, our, how to organize our data lake, so we're trying to put more use cases here to try to gain more values than we did at first place with our proof of concept project or whatever. Then we have stage three, proactive stage, where we have analytics and data science using data lake. So basically we have a bunch of data scientists and analysts that are consuming data from our data set, from our data lake, that are generating reports, uh, making dashboards and the reports available to their business users. And the organization, of course, should always make decisions based on these reports. And then we have stage four, where we have core competency in the data lake, uh, basically, uh, we have an enterprise data architecture and we managed to be succeeded with our goal to revolutionize and update, modernize our data lake architecture. And basically, we can treat data lake here as a common repository for our enterprise data within the organization. And we can always be sure that we have relevant information here that are a single point of truth, actually. Okay, how should one company then start building a data lake? Well, first, it is important to think of the use cases uh, that you will try to deliver and cover with Data Lake. And the uh, important thing here is not to plan all of the possible use cases. It's impossible. It's just important to have a few, few use cases in mind. Because if we have few use cases in mind, then we know how to plan uh, the architecture for this. So we will probably plan with this approach. We will plan uh, architecture that will support many use cases on top. Uh, if we try to plan all the use cases, we probably will never start building a data lake. Then it's important to master the technology and to figure out actually how the systems should communicate, which part of the data lake does what job, and what is the best tool for the job, actually. And then try to go agile and flexible. This can sometimes really be tricky, especially if you're a large corporation, we have a lot of different policies, uh, if it, this part can really be tricky sometimes to just at this point to start going agile to try to do things the other way. But if we manage to succeed with this, uh, it really gen can generate a lot of value. And of course, we should never forget about the data governance, data quality, data security, data management. And while I was preparing for this presentation, I read an article on Katie Nuggets. Uh, it was an article by, I know the name of the girl from SAS, where she said that actually that in the modern data architecture, the only thing that should stay the same as this in traditional architectures is the part that concerns data government, data security, data quality, and data management. And of course, in order to have useful benefits, to have valuable insights from our data lake, we need to know who actually has access to what data, whether data is relevant or not, whether our records are accurate or not. We need to make sure that we have security implemented at the top. We really need to take care about these things. But uh, sometimes uh, organization can go a bit too formal with this approach, and we can easily drown in this. So yeah, it's, it is important to care, take care about this stuff. But if uh, your users of Data Lake are actually your data scientists, they probably already know how to deal with data governance, data security, data quality, basically with all of these concepts. 
And last but not the least, it is important to integrate with BI, with Data Warehouse. It is important to uh, deploy this, the final insights to decision makers, to people who actually make some decisions, to people who should actually use uh, these kinds of reports and these kinds of data to have some decisions made based on that. Because otherwise, uh, the whole purpose of our of our data lake doesn't make any sense. There is no reason to deploy data lake with this thing in mind, without this thing in mind. And what is the most important, of course, it is to make data accessible to data, data scientists and to let them go fishing in the lake, to let them try to utilize this data, to try to generate and generate value actually from this, uh, from this data. Otherwise, the whole job we did, the whole, it, projects of building data lakes doesn't make any sense and we will probably never have a support of business uh, if we don't do this and yeah that's it for me today and I just want to mention one more time the thing you had a chance to hear yesterday from uh, my colleague Darko uh, is a data science Serbia community we are organizing a data science lab uh, where we're trying to educate ourselves and uh, the community about data science and Keep reading the Data Science Serbia blog. Uh, we will get you will get a lot of useful information actually here pretty soon. So stay focused. And that's it for me for today. I'm here to answer all of your questions, if there are any, of course. Sorry. Go. Oh, you mean in practice? Yeah. Well, uh, there wasn't only one project, there were a few. But I can say that uh, the largest one had about a terabyte of data incoming per day. And how many days did you have it in the full Sorry, how? What's the biggest size of, of the data set you had to query? For example, that example when, when you want to do a full text search, what was the data size against which you had to do that search? Oh, sorry. Uh, you didn't understand me. I did never use this uh, full text search uh, scenario. I, I didn't test it out. But basically, I have the largest table probably that we are querying in Hive has more than 20 terabytes. Yes. This is actually a part of data lake architecture that uh, is really important and there are many tools that try to deal with this and it is the really important thing to consider because uh, if we don't do this part of the job then the, our data lake will probably crash and after a year we wouldn't know what we have written inside, the, inside our data, data lake and we will probably have to start from the beginning. So it is important for every record that we write the way we do it. Uh, we know for each record from which system does that uh, record arrive and at what time was it written into our data lake. So basically some of the concepts are pretty similar and standard to data warehouse and that's basically the reason why people usually think that uh, data warehouse and data lake are confronted. I know whether I answered your Yeah, uh, well, of course. Uh, in terms of, let's say, data governance, there are tools, if you're thinking about the, uh, open source tools, or yeah. in terms of open source for data governance, we have uh, Atlas, that's the name of the project. But I really have to say that these uh, projects are really not mature enough for the purpose they serve. So yeah, that, there is Apache Atlas as, uh, as one solution. And that's actually the thing that uh, any user that has access to the data lake should really keep in mind uh, that they really need to take care of what they are doing, uh, where are they writing all that records, and who has access to what. And that's really important policy to, to make uh, during building the, the architecture. So, so you actually implementing your own? 
Yeah, most of the times, yes. <laughs> or try to use uh, some standardized tools from different vendors, or depends on the project actually. And actually, it depends uh, quite a bit, quite a lot on the client and what client actually has accessible within the organization. And that's really, yes. Yes. Well, of course, it depends on the use case. Uh, HBase is really amazing for some fast queries. Uh, queries. Queries in HBase run much faster. But I think in terms of the how much money we will pay uh, by the end of the project, I think that HDFS can do amazing job. And because I don't think there is a reason to keep everything in HBase. For many use cases, yes, but not all of them. And that's ma the main reason why I think that HDFS should be on the bottom, and then we can have some of the data, of course, transferred to HBase because we don't need uh, such a use case where we would read it from HDFS. We can just transfer that part of the data to, to HBase. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so thank you, and you can see the, here my contact information. Uh, please feel free to write me on whatever concerns, concerns you, whatever you want to talk about, I would be really glad to, to answer all of your questions. And, yeah. Thank you.